two minutes until showtime. One minute until showtime. All right, I'll check on something real quick and I'll be back before the song's over. Uh, here's a new concept, the empty chair. Your shoe will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Every single morning, every single day, I go outside and see a world really going to change. I'm looking right to left. I see we got the number to tell your father, brother, sister, and your mother that it starts with us.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is a little bit after five o'clock Pacific time here. And uh, man, it's gotten cold out here for California. So I'd say it's a perfect time to uh, pull up a cup of Joe and, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's make the world a better place. So if you're listening to this show for your first time, you are either uh, on our phone line where you're you just picked up your phone and dialed 563-999-3052. And you can see that right behind me over there, right there. And, uh, or you're watching this thing live streaming on Facebook, in which case um, you can just listen to it right there on the Human Solution International page, or hopefully it's being shared across the land right now. Or you're listening to us on the relevant app, and that in that case, it's a vibe stream that's also going on right now. <laughs> if you missed us today, you can always go back and listen to the, uh, you know, the recorded Facebook version of it, or click on the blog talk for the archive. But it is rebroadcast at Radio KM 420 on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock Central Time. That's eight o'clock in the morning Pacific time. And, uh, you know, we're glad to have you. This is a podcast brought to you by the Human Solution International. I'm your host, Joe Grumbide, and I have Craig, my compadre co-host, Craig Cecil, who is a recently totally free man. And uh, he's in his second week of total freedom. And we're can't wait to talk about that. And, you know, people, um, I think people, um, overlook the value of freedom a lot because you hear so many people whine and bitch and moan about so many things that are so trivial and then you go and you look at at how people are in a place where there isn't freedom you know e evenly distributed like it is here in america to the best you know maybe maybe one of the better places in the world certainly not perfect and and a lot of people lose their freedom um, that certainly shouldn't, and Craig's a perfect example of that. Um, but you know, every time you, I see somebody that's whining and bitching about something ridiculous, um, it it makes me think of people like Craig who have suffered, um, you know, tremendously at, as a loss of freedom for something that made no sense and. Uh, we're still working hard out here, even though a lot of people think that legalization is the, the law of the land. Um, we just had another, I just saw another article today, um, and I think it was about somebody that we talked about in the reentry program about a guy who uh, had a medical or had a license, a cannabis distribution license in Oklahoma, and um, he went to federal prison just recently um, or not too long ago. And uh, there he sits. And it was a, a, an article written by one of the advocate groups about, you know, the thing that we've been saying all along, it's not legal till it's legal. And it's not legal, even if your state or your city or your county gives you a license, federal government can still walk in there at any time for any reason and slap those cuffs on you, take away all of your property and charge you with federal crimes that could and might um, cause you to end up with a life sentence, which has happened so many times. And unfortunately, um, there's nothing that says it won't happen again. Craig, how are you doing today? How are you enjoying your, uh, your newly found freedom? I'm enjoying it a lot. I don't have to worry about going to the south suburbs and making sure I don't accidentally cross the line in from uh, here in Illinois into uh, Indiana or things of that sort. Right. And I want to point out that as much as I, I hear all the time that, well, here marijuana is legal. And, and that, that expression is heard a lot in California where you are. Oh, yeah. And there is recreational marijuana stores all over and yep. medical marijuana recipients and all that. Same as here in Illinois. Same as, uh, what is it, 16 uh, recreational legal. Something like that. About now. Yeah. And uh, and all the time people use, oh, marijuana is legal here. When in reality, 
only this much of marijuana is legal. To because this in people. any one of those states, if you have this much marijuana in the back seat of your car, right. you can still go to prison. And unfortunately, too many people still are. Right. And I mean, we're, we're talking a 16 bolt, you know, pound bowling balls worth of marijuana. Yep. We'll get you a minimum five years in Illinois and in, in, in a lot of cases. And, and how can that be? How can that be? You know, um, they, they call it a medicine, but I can have all the aspirin I want. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, what's funny? I was, I was talking to somebody uh, this morning or earlier today. And we were talking about a, a substance that the federal government or the, the FDA uh, just put on the controlled list. And it's a herbal natural supplement ingredient that I use in some of my products. And it's, it's, a, um, it's a, an antidote for Tylenol poisoning. And I just laughed at that. I mean, I laughed and cringed at the same time because a seven-year-old child can walk into Walmart and purchase cases of Tylenol, right? There's nothing, there's no restriction on it. There's no age limit. There's no amount limit. This, this seven-year-old kid could fill up a shopping cart full of Tylenol and, and pay for it and eat them all and die from it or need this substance that is a natural, naturally occurring supplement item that's great for all kinds of things. But you can't, you can't, get it for them because now the federal government says you got to have a an fda approval for that and and this kid can die easily from too much acetaminophen right but there's no restrictions to it no limits of any kind fda says it's fine it's safe it's an over-the-counter drug and there's no restrictions no limits of any kind whatsoever and yet like you just said if if you were to have whatever a legal amount of, of of cannabis you probably aren't going to face a whole lot of grief but what if you had like you said 5 10 15 20 pounds of cannabis and people freak out they go oh that's so much but have you ever made oil or or known anybody that did do you know how much cannabis it takes to make a medical amount of oil and do you know that all of the products that are made from cannabis are they use oil to make them because that's the only way you can really standardize it make it work right so in order to make any kind of medicinal grade product that has any value at all it requires a huge amount of cannabis to do that and yet in most cases like you just said those amounts are considered totally illegal unless you are in that you know fraction that little group there that gets the license that has all the or something all the, like that. Yeah, it's it's just insane, completely insane. Well, you just locked up, but you you look like you're moving now. Yep, yep. Okay, I think you're okay now. We lost you for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, it somehow kicked me out because you were locked up for a while. So. Oh, okay. Well, I was yapping. You know how I am. <laughs> <laughs> But, but as I was mentioning, you know, that these quantities that people call ridiculous are really not that ridiculous. I mean, lots of people throw a wedding reception and go out and buy $1,000 or $2,000 worth of liquor. Yeah. Now, of course, they're not going to sit out in the night by themselves and drink that, but it, it's not illegal for them to have that, to fill up the back of the van with that, to, uh, you know, um, you and, have and nobody bats an eye at that. <clears throat> well, not only that, but I mean, there is literally no limit to it. You know, people have wine cellars that have thousands of bottles of wine in it, right? And 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 people say, "Oh, wow, what a nice thing!" You know, they consider it a uh, a value. It's a good what a what a great thing. But what if you had a pot cellar and you wanted to collect a pound of every kind of pot because you like to, right? Nope, that's totally illegal. It's it's you know it's there's. There isn't a state in the world that you could have a pot seller and have a pound of every kind of weed like you can have a bottle of every kind of wine or a case of every kind of wine or, or 10 cases. You just And in the pot legal states, it's still illegal to grow pot that is too strong. Right. <laughs> it's illegal. To, I mean, now who could think of that? You know? right. 
Well, and that's yet I could walk in the liquor store and buy a bottle of Everclear, which I think is pretty much pure alcohol. You pretty know? much pure alcohol, exactly. You, you, we, we used to use that to to make oil, um, you know, out of the cannabis. But you know what's funny is you can take wine and cook it down and make brandy out of it, right? And that brandy is actually a wine concentrate, right? Right. But when people do that with cannabis, it's, you know, you're manufacturing illegal, dangerous substances. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. You know, when in California, when they, when they reeled out the 90 seconds. Oh no, Bobby, did you set, you set. I see he's still there. Yeah, you set the blog talk for 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 minutes, not hours. Uh oh. Oh, that's okay. Well, we're gonna probably lose the blog talk stream. I don't know. It lets me go overtime, so we may just be fine. But we got a glitch. It thinks we only got ninety <laughs> seconds left. But I think it gives me an hour of overtime if I need it. So we'll just keep rolling. We're fine. Um, but. What I was saying was, um, shoot, now I got derailed on top of it all. <laughs> oh, well. But yeah. but there's lots of products where, like you say, that the strength of it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the strength of alcohol doesn't matter, the, the amount of alcohol. And, you know, look at all the different strains of marijuana, what people can do with marijuana that is supposedly illegal. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, and, and so, you know, these are all things that, you know, we, we as an advocate organization um, have never really championed the, the term legalization because it's so misleading. Um, oh, I know what I was saying. In California, when we were passing our recreational laws, um, most of the versions of them uh, would would tout regulate marijuana like alcohol. That was their 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 catchphrase or their slogan, right? So that people would go, oh yeah, that's fine. We're going to regulate it like alcohol. But the truth is, what they did was nothing like alcohol in any way, shape, or form. And and for the reasons that that you have just described, um, they don't make alcohol manufacturers test their alcohol for every possible. Uh, contaminant that might possibly be in the in the starting mix, right? I mean, no, because, and they don't have to have cameras and video monitors twenty four seven, right? Watching the corn grow that they you know distill exactly. into the potatoes or what you know whatever else the grapes for the wine, you know. Well, and, and you got to wonder, right? So so corn, wheat, rye, barley, hops um you know uh every every possible grain even potatoes um these are all things that uh, uh you know alcohol is made out of but like you said they don't they don't check the potato fields or the or the juniper bushes you know for for anything and and it, you know they use pesticides on those products um you know they spray they spray um the same pesticides that are deemed illegal for for cannabis they spray those on the the crops that they make alcohol with and you know they have determined them and they, they don't go crazy testing the process of processing it no. now they do have rules about the final product better not have more than you know this metal or this you yeah. know yeah, uh, have... carcinogen or whatever so and it, but they, they don't regulate the process they regulate the product, you know. Exactly, exactly. And, and I have no problem with actual safety concerns. You know, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that, you know, if, if, if there is a regulated market or there isn't a regulated market that you know, you might want to buy from the regulated market because there's some basic safety concerns being addressed. But the truth is you can buy um you know a craft beer from somebody or you can drink maybe you can't sell it i think if you make your own alcohol you're not supposed to sell it but you can you can go to your friend's house who has a little distillery who makes his own whiskey or makes his own his own beer and you can drink it and it's not illegal right but 
there's a chance if you did that, that the guy might not have done a good job and, and you could get sick from it. And people know that, right? So he takes your chances. And, and, and you know, over the, the years, plenty of people have died from alcohol poisoning because of bad alcohol, right? There's all kinds of, you know, in prohibition, a lot of people died from, you know, they were making alcohol out of sawdust and things that were not, you know, not good. And so, uh, but you don't even have that concern with cannabis. Like that's not a thing. Like there's no, there's no cannabis strain that's going to be like methanol is and it'd be poisonous. There's no poisonous cannabis strain. I mean, of course there was the paraquat, you know, incidents years ago and all that. But like I say, in my own experience, in my own canvassing, the bud tenders that work for the uh, uh, dispensaries here in Illinois that I've talked to, and right. even many from other states, uh, they to a person, they all tell me that they, they get most, if not all, of their uh, own personal use marijuana from the guy on the corner that they've known for years, you know, exactly. because they trust him. They right. they know what he delivers and they trust him. And the price is a third of what the store would charge, you know. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, this whole notion about legalization, you know, I think if we get down to the core of the problem, um, you know, it's, this is about liberty, about freedom, about, about you know, when you talk about paraquat, it was the government that was putting that paraquat on the field. Yes. It wasn't people doing that. It was a that was a uh, an herbicide that was to kill the plant, not to not to make it better. And so, you know, these are all things that that reality. When you start peeling away the onion on it, it a lot of these things have nothing to do with safety. They have to do with um, you know, limiting a market, there's monopolies involved, there's, there's influences. Um, and of course, there's tax revenue, and, and all of these things, you know, add up to it helps the big guys, and it helps the government, but it really doesn't help the people very much at all. And most importantly, maybe it doesn't do anything for the people that are locked up. It doesn't do anything for the people, even the people that get out, after they've been locked up, it doesn't do anything for them. And it doesn't, at this point, do anything to keep people from getting locked up. So I think that, you know, if we rethink our position on legalization a little bit um, and start looking at, you know, we, we have some problems outside of that. And it would sure be great to, um, you know, to resolve those as we always have of the people, by the people and for the people, humans helping humans. And, uh, you know, I think that's where our re-entry. Oh, right. I'm hoping to put you on speakerphone and uh, let you talk to the audience of A Cup of Joe. This is a podcast that supports those of us seeking to uh, normalize cannabis in the, uh, you know, in the American market. And that's concerned with people like you in federal prison. Um, would you like to, uh, to, to speak with our audience right now? All right, hang on, Rory. Rory, let me put you on speakerphone, and hopefully, I'm going to do this right. You, you know my <laughs> technical savvy. <laughs> Look at this. Craig is a is a technical genius. All right, try this now, Rory. See if you can talk to our audience. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, Rory. We, tell tell everybody how you ended up in federal prison. Uh, well, I was in a relationship with a woman that had a little tiny grow room in her basement. And one of her friends, ex-husband, turned her in. And the feds raided her house. And they asked her who she sold the marijuana to. And she said, some guy comes over in a rental car. I don't know his name or his phone number. And they said, who helps you grow? And she told them that I helped her because she didn't want to tell on her friend. And her friends were the ones that told on her, and she never told on them. So they know she's lying. So they come to my house, and I just say, look, I'm not saying anything without an attorney. Needless to say, the DEA got pretty mad. They threatened to kill me. I told them, I don't care what you do, but I'm not saying anything without an attorney. And it just snowballed from there. When they got me convicted of helping her grow marijuana, 
then, of course, in the media, it says I'm the mastermind of a huge marijuana grow in Iowa, and the judge gave me 20 years, even though I was never charged with a sec code section that has a 20-year mandatory minimum. She just changed it. And uh, circuit court denied me a certificate of appealability because they knew if I ever got back into court, they'd have to dismiss the charges because the DEA made a fatal mistake. Well, fatal for me, but they made a fatal mistake when they did not check the 317 cuttings she just cut for root systems. And the law is a plant is a plant with observable root formation of stem and leaves. And if there is no root system, then you have to use the reusable marijuana. Well, she had 317 tiny plants or you know, 300 tiny plants and 17 little mother plants about 10 inches tall. And they let everybody that testified against me go free and they put me in prison for 20 years. Because I was a rodeo clown and I was all over the internet, the prosecutor was only part time. And needless, this call is from a federal prison. Needless to say, he got lots of media coverage, and he just happened to get on full time then. Wow. Now, Rory, what, what do you have to say for all the people that say marijuana is legal pretty much everywhere? They have recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, all that. What do you have to say to those people? And, and uh, tell them where you're standing to tell us what you have to say. <laughs> I don't quite understand the question, but I guess if it's legal in so many places, why do they keep people in prison that are in for marijuana? I mean, I was never charged with, manu with uh, possession and distribution. I was only charged with manufacturing. And that's insane. And, and where are you now? Sandstone, Minnesota at the low. So you're at a low custody federal correctional institution, right? Yes. And now that's, that's insane. I because I had a question. They took, they, they, I got my comp, my sentence computation and they said, I'm not eligible for anything with the first step back. And they just turned down my elderly offenders home confinement request. I put it in Monday, or well, I put it in Friday, and Tuesday morning, I already got denied. And I qualify in every way. So how is that, that, that a case can be denied appealability? What, what, I never, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. Oh, sadly, in the federal system, if you make a post-conviction challenge to like the representation of your attorney or things in your case that your attorney didn't do up front. Uh, and you, you make that claim in a post-conviction uh, relief claim. Under the Biden bill, which passed back in, uh, uh, actually in, in the uh, early 1990s, you're not allowed to uh, uh, appeal that the, uh, your sentencing court turning you down for relief even if you're totally right under the law, that court, the court that sentences you, has to give you permission called a certificate of appealability for the appellate court to review what that judge did. It's up to the judge of whether you can appeal that judge's decision or not. It's so, one of the craziest things in law. So was, was did you go to trial? Yes. So in, in your trial, when they were presenting that evidence, I, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of things in, about these laws that maybe not everybody does, but the idea of an of a unrooted cutting to be considered to be a plant without your, your defense counsel bringing that up, how did that happen? I only paid him fifty thousand. I guess that wasn't enough money. Wow. I, I was doing pretty well. I had I owned two car dealerships. I clowned about thirty five, forty rodeos a year. I made about a hundred thousand clowning rodeos. And they, these lawyers didn't know anything, and they did not want to challenge the judge. This call is from a federal prison. And the reason they cannot give me a certificate of appealability 
because if I ever get a hearing, I'm going to bring up the root systems. And then they'd have nothing because, like I said before, I was never charged with possession and distribution because they don't have anybody that said they ever sold me marijuana or anybody that ever bought marijuana from me. They basically just got the jury to find me guilty for helping her grow marijuana. And the jury, 10 of them, tried to find me not guilty. The judge says, no, get back there and come up with a unanimous decision. At 5 p.m. on Friday, the 10 not guilty voting jurors changed their vote to guilty so they could go home because they figured it was just helping this woman grow marijuana so I'd get a slap on the wrist. Yeah, you know, I, slap I, on the wrist, all right. Well, I, yeah, know. they slapped handcuffs on your wrist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, 20 for twenty years. How many times, Craig, have you seen or have you heard about trials ending on a Friday? Because the jury doesn't. It's so want to common; they want to get out of there. They, yeah, they do it all the time. And 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 what yep, you said, unfortunately. And here's, what, and here's what happened in my case. My case. We started the jury trial Monday morning. After they select a jury, they postponed the trial for two days because they knew how many witnesses everybody had, when we'd be done, and they figured that way, at Friday night, the people voting not guilty will cave. Right. And mysteriously, and I've interviewed tons of other inmates that went to trial, mysteriously, there's always one or two jurors that say you're guilty no matter how unbelievable the facts are or the evidence is. I'm yeah, not saying right. they're plants, but I'm saying they're plants. Yeah. No, you're over and over again I saw that. You're you're right. And that's why it's supposed to be, you know, a, a unanimous jury verdict, uh, you know, to convict. But Unfortunately, what they did to you, they do to people all the time. A lot of times they get them on conspiracy and, and the jury is never uh, allowed to have any idea what the possible implication is. And they assume, because it seems like such a trivial thing, right? Just like what you just described or, or even a conspiracy case of, of, of a nonviolent drug offense, who, what jury in their right mind would think that somebody would end up you know, in prison for 20 to life. And yet, more often than not, those are the things that happen. It's it's unbelievable. So is there any kind of, I mean, is there any other avenue to, to file for some kind of a, um, you know, a, of an appeal? Yes, I, I filed to the Supreme Court, but they did the same thing to deny me a certificate of appealability because the Supreme Court gets... 40,000 civil suits and about 10,000 criminal cases in a year and they only hear 70 cases so your chances of getting hurt are almost slim and none and slim not only left town but he got killed on the way out <laughs> so so is there a place where okay so you know i don't know if you even know much about our group the human solution international but you know we're an advocacy group and and many of us myself included have have gone through the the criminal justice system and been locked up and all different types of scenarios but we're a grassroots organization and sometimes uh, uh you know a public action whether it's you know an appeal through phone calls or letters or 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 even a protest or whatever is there some kind of a of a place that would be able to be affected by that is there any is there any any place we could direct well, attention to? Craig would probably know that. I'm over 60. I have no violence. I don't even have a, a drunk driving. And I've done over 50% of my time, and they still deny me going to home confinement under the elderly offenders for, uh, home confinement program. So if you could put pressure on region, the, the Bureau of Prison Region Office in Kansas City, Kansas, that would probably help because I think on a CARES Act, elderly offender home confinement, I think they actually have the last say on that. Well, and remember, Joe, uh, and, and I really want for all the listeners to remember, 
I was turned down for the CARES Act as well back in 2020. And if you remember, your people reached out in a call to action and made a lot of calls and a lot of emails directly to the prison and to the director of the Bureau of Prisons. Sherry also garnered her group of people and others to uh, make those calls as well. And that made, that made the world a difference. As you know, the next thing I heard from the warden is that, well, we've reconsidered and here's the date you're leaving. So I'd like to see people contact the federal prison at Sandstone, Minnesota and say, what about Rory Meeks? And uh, hope you don't mind me putting your name out there, Rory. No, that's fine. Yeah, I, what I'd like to do, Rory, is to put together a press release. Um, and that way we can sort of create a call to action. We have a website that we can use to direct people. And I, this is just one of those, I mean, unfortunately, in 12 years of doing this, I, we, we've just run into case after case, but this is really one of the one of the 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 more egregious ones i mean there's so many you know horror stories but this is one that i think we can tug on a lot of heartstrings you know there's a lot of people believe it or not that even though they support you know cannabis legalization and whatnot when they hear about somebody that's in prison they always say well they must have done something but it sounds like your case is one of these super clean ones that we can get even the even the, the the people that kind of the naysayers to to get behind this and you know in the past we've had hundreds of people that were able to you know get a message maybe even thousands i don't ever know you know you don't know what kind of a impact that you actually have sometimes but i think we can put together a good call to action on this one what do you think craig I, i'm sure we can and like i say i'm proof that it works yeah. Because I didn't file any appeal to region or anything else. I, I basically made my request to you, to Sherry Sicard, to other activists, and they and, and all their followers stepped up. And like I say, the next thing that the uh, CMC, which is somebody right under the uh, warden in a prison, the, the case manager coordinator, just came to me and said, you know, we, we got all these responses in that. And, uh, you know, here's your date to go home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think what we need I to do is hang up. I'm out of time. Okay. Thanks, well, Rory. We're gonna Just give your last time. message to our audience. All right. Well, appreciate everything you guys do, and thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Rory. We're we're gonna find a way to help you. We're gonna All do right, our Rory. best. Thank you. <sighs> you know, Craig, this that reminded me so much of the calls we used to do with you. Yes, especially with the recording in there. All of it. It was uh, almost, <laughs> almost like a, a nightmare flashback. You know, you ever have one of those recurring dreams? I know when I was going, excuse me, when I was going through my trial, I used to have these sort of recurring nightmares, you know, about the events that had happened and getting locked up and, you know, just all kinds of horrible things. And, uh, when you hear those that, you know, this is a call from a federal inmate, you're just like, whoa, uh, that's one of those, one of those, um, I don't know, trigger points, I think. But just as you just noticed now, and people on the video had noticed, when my phone rang, I saw it was a call from the federal prison system. Right. And I listened to hear the name of the person, and I knew this was a person you'd want to hear from. Absolutely. Now, granted, there, there's... Virtually all the people in there are serving sentences that don't match their crime, if it even is a crime. Right. But he's one of the more egregious stories is that, you know, he has no history of violence. Right. He has no list of 20 prior convictions. He does have one prior marijuana conviction. But again, it's a minor case that, you know, he got a little bit of probation for. And so what? Right. I mean, you know, it, it, it what he demonstrated was really it 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 was the quintessential experience of the problem with the justice system you know this this weekend i was in atlanta and we were we were meeting we you know bobby had talked about this international truth and justice tribunal that we put together working with i don't know about a dozen other nonprofits and emory university and we're doing this 
um, moot court trial, um, you know, with regards to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and this and the 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 government of Belgium. But while we were doing this, one of the guys that we were that was actually really kind of spearheading this guy named Richard Freeman, and he he's an attorney. <clears throat> and he left his law practice because of the corruption. He he told us a few examples of just the things that happened behind closed doors that were just egregious. And, and that was on a on a you know a civil and business sort of level. But you get to the criminal level, and I'm telling you, the story that this guy just described, a part-time um, you know, deputy US attorney um coming in more or less making a name for himself and and taking this guy's notoriety as a rodeo clown and and building it into a bigger case than it was and ultimately bolstering his career as a result now you got to wonder what kind of backroom conversations was happening between him the dea and the judge to cause this to happen and i i can't help but think that there was something you know, sinister and dastardly. I mean, I don't know how, how, you know, PG, I can. I mean, those it. people had to know. They, yeah. they had to know that they have pictures <clears throat> and all that. But as you know, that you've seen that trial, that Bobby knows and many of our listener knows, the trials don't make sense. In the middle of my sentencing hearing twice, after I mentioned things in my, uh, you're allowed to give a statement before sentencing. The judge paused it and brought the prosecutor and my my lawyer back into the back room after I brought up uh, certain things. And they talked back in his chambers, not on the record. You know, it was not recorded. It was not monitored. And especially me as the defendant didn't know what was being said, but they came out and changed things. And uh, changed things, especially for what was being represented for my sentence in the fact that my lawyer had waived an objection. Now, why wasn't I part of that discussion? And right. that is how our justice system works. Like you say, it's a lot of backroom wrangling, you know? Well, and you know, I, I've, I've told this story before, but when I was going through my case, uh, when, you know, I had beat the first case and I was, I was waiting for the second trial, I thought, oh no, it might've been before my first trial. Anyways, this this well-known attorney, he was a cannabis activist attorney, and and actually his daughter was my co-defendant's counsel. And we were at a, at an event um, in where, you know, I was always representing the human solution and always, always advocating for the work we were doing even back then. And this guy took me aside and he pled with me, he says, don't go to trial, just whatever you do, just find a way, take a plea, they'll give you a good plea. And, and this guy's known as a plea attorney. He's not a, he's not a trial attorney. And he takes people's money, takes tons of money from people, and he negotiates plea deals. Sometimes he does good ones, sometimes not. But he told me, he goes, you're never going to get a fair trial. He says, there's no such thing as a fair trial. He says, they don't happen. Once in a blue moon, just like anything, you know, there, there, there are, there are some good cops out there. I would never say there's not, but are they all good? Nope. Are, are a lot of them not good? I would think so. Uh, is there a lot of institutional problems that makes it easy to not be good? And what I mean by good is fair, um, you know, actually serving and protecting the citizens that you're supposed to be rather than whatever else they're doing. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, the same thing with the prosecutor. Prosecutor's job isn't to get a conviction at all cost, a prosecutor's job is to select the cases where there's actually a case and go after those, you know, with with a with a, a vigorous trial, just like the defense attorneys, right? I mean, the prosecutor's job is not to take everything that comes their way and 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 flex every muscle they have and pull every string and cash in every favor to get the guy convicted at any cost. That's not the prosecutor's job, but you wouldn't know it if you ever spent time in criminal court, because they sure act that way. Well, look at poor Rory. These are cuttings from plants about the size of your hand. And he was get held responsible for a kilo of marijuana, 2.2 pounds, for each one of those cuttings because they considered him a plant. 
Right. Now, how logical is that to anybody? It's not. Right. For one, it's not 2.2 pounds, and it's not a plant. It's just a cutting from a plant. You know? Right. <sighs> yeah, I, I remember at, at my trial, um, you know, they had caught me with 3,000 plants, but the bulk, the lion's share of them were were cuttings. And that was one of the things that, you know, if we needed to, luckily, though, that never came up. And, and even more luckily, the feds never picked it up. But had they, I mean, I was facing a 10 year mandatory minimum without without blinking an eyelash. And I was guilty without blinking an eyelash because there was no federal defense. Right. So that was what I was staring down the barrel of the whole time. And, you know, the fact that this federal judge went and took a case where there was no mandatory minimum and no, um, what do they call it when they have contributing or factors that uh, enhancements, they didn't have any kind of enhancements uh, that, that should have told the judge, well, you should probably stack this one. He still gave him way, way more than the recommended sentence. And that's, and, and then to make it not be an appealable case. I mean, to me, you just got to wonder um, I think Craig, we need to we need to really draft this up, um, and and create a, a a press release and a call to action and um, really give a clear description of what people can do um, and how to do it even um, and and even maybe you know I don't know I lost Becca because we're in we're in the time machine over on the other thing so um, but it's. <laughs> It's all being recorded. It's okay. We warp time and space. Excellent. But but that like I say, that's what got relief for me. That yeah. the the small number of activists that or that the active people that are actually actually listening right now that actually will make a phone call to uh, Sandstone, that will send an email to uh, Sandstone to uh, the director of the Bureau of Prisons. You know the, these things make a make a huge difference and they walked me out of prison on June 16th after I was turned down the end of May. The reason I was turned down the end of May, oh, well, you know, um, first of all, uh, you you had gotten in trouble for hot water in your cell a few years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that... uh, you know, was I a danger that that hot water also had my instant coffee in it, you know? Right. <laughs> but um, these are the kind of excuses they give. And, um, but with, once I got all that, that pressure from the phone calls from your listeners, from Sherry's group, um, that convinced them that it was easier for them to release me. <laughs> and right. the, the warden himself came to me and mentioned, you're not even eligible for relief. He goes, I can't release you because you're a lifer. Right. He says, you know what? I'm not worried about you committing a crime. There's never going to be a problem with you. Here's your release date. Wow. So that's how much discretion they have. And the reason that he did that is your followers, Sherry's followers, um, you know, made, made the prison know that I had that support. And, we're, and I'm asking everybody, support Rory. What you just heard from Rory, that is Rory. You know, Rory is well, right. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is we're going to capture this segment where he told his story, and we're going to we're going to put it up there so people can hear it, um, you know, for themselves. And I I really believe if there was a a slam dunk um, appeal, you know how it is, Craig. People will find any reason to to not support a case. Like even the guy that had, a, 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 you know, three dispensaries, I was the guy that had three dispensaries. And there were some people that says, well, you shouldn't have three dispensaries. Well, okay, <laughs> based on what, you know, I mean, the guy had two car dealerships, why that wasn't a problem. You know, the guy had multiple businesses, that wasn't a problem. So who cares? No, and he had fame. I don't know if you remember a yeah. few years back, there was a Dodge Ram pickup commercial where they showed the truck going out into a um, a rodeo. Okay. And the rodeo clown did a bunch of stuff and jumped up on the back of the pickup and they hauled a bunch of stuff away. That okay. was Rory. Oh, Rory, no Rory started in three Dodge Ram commercials. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
And, and, so, and, so that's the kind of guy he is. He, right. he's, a, he's a normal Joe, except named Rory. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and, you know, the thing of it is, is even the people, like when I was locked up, the, the question everybody said inside where, I, you know, the, 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 the place that I was at, people would come up to me because they heard I was the pot guy, right? And the first thing everybody asked, didn't matter who they were, they could have been gangsters, they could have been drug dealers, they could have been violent people, it didn't matter because everybody was where, we, where I was at. And they said, well, how much did you have? Right, because they thought, you know, I must have had, you know, thousands of, of, of pounds or whatever, you know, everybody has in their mind this magic number where it's too much. This guy's talking about nothing. I mean, literally nothing. I mean, the amount that she had of usable material, even 300 if, seedlings. Come yeah, on. That's nothing. I mean, that's a that's a couple of trays of cuttings. And even if they all rooted and were all good and viable, it would have been months before they could have produced anything. So, you know. Right. And like you say, my daughter ran around saying that my dad is in prison for life for marijuana. And she says to a person, the next question is, but who did he kill? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that would they, they that was the second thing they'd ask me, well, what else did you do? Because nobody really believed, even on even in the state level and in, in where I was at, they didn't believe it. You know, they were like, "Well, well, what are you, what are you doing here?" And and you know, imagine that in in a in a simple place where I was at, as opposed to, you know, a place that you were at, where you know it's supposed to be for only the most violent and and uh, you know, I mean, everything. You were the next level down from a supermax. You were you were a, a one of the, I was in a high custody penitentiary, yeah, you know. You were where where dangerous people are supposed to be held. I saw a lot of killings, you know what I mean? Uh, unfortunately, that, that's part of that environment. Wow. And, and, and that's sad. Why was I there? Yeah. Even the even the staff would come to me saying, you don't belong here, you know. And, and they met not only in the high custody prison, but in prison altogether. Wow. And these are the guards. And Rory, is, I'm sure, is hearing the same thing even in the low custody institution he's in. Well, I think I think we have the makings for a good call to action. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stomp on the gas on this one because I really think that um, you know this is one maybe we'll be able to um, engage some of our some of our partners in this and and uh, you know take this all the way through our YouTube channel and and. Uh, the social media platforms and the website and everything. Um, and like I said, uh, I think what we'll, we'll be able to do is take the, take the piece of this that is recorded and be able to use that to create a, uh, a press release. If you could send me the details that you have regarding where we would send um, and how to address um, you know, the, the, the regional department that we were talking about. And uh, uh, maybe even, maybe we could even create a, you're, you're good at, at legal writing. Maybe there's a way to just create a simple template um, that would be clear and accurate and, and, you know, useful. Not that everybody has to copy it word for word, but at least to have the, the salient points that would make sure that they knew this was for them. And people, yes, and, and I just want people to know who he is. He's Rory, R O R Y, Meeks, M E E K S. Now, his inmate number, and I'm going to give it again at the end of the show, but his inmate number is 6613802.9. I'll give it again at the end of the show, but I want people to be able to reach out to the info at BOP.org and say, what's going on? Why is Rory 60 something years old in the middle of a place where people have gotten COVID for the third and fourth time it's so rampant in a prison? Why is he being exposed to this as a marijuana offender that's already served uh, 10 years of his 20 year sentence? And, I mean, and, this is ridiculous. Let, let, let's help him, you know? And, and the thing that's crazy is that even, you know, after 10 years, you know, I mean, it's not like they, this is 10 years later after the fact, and they're still 
uh, the powers that be that still want to keep their thumb down on this guy that hard. You know, I mean, he was saying that because of the CARES Act, he didn't qualify because of, you know, they didn't, they didn't, the powers that be that are the prosecution and the judge and, and, you know, whoever's influenced by that. Well, the CARES Act is, is totally up to the staff at the prison where he's at. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, so that, that's why I'm asking people, reach out to the prison, reach out to the uh, Washington, D.C. main office of the Bureau of Prisons, because they can put some questions and some pressures at the institutional level where he's at. And, and that's, that's what we need to do, because that's something that you cannot even appeal to a judge, because that is considered sending, uh, transferring somebody to home confinement, as I was. Um, that's a, a total discretionary uh, decision left by law to the Bureau of Prisons where somebody does their time. So a judge can't even review it. Other people cannot even review it. But if that warden, if that case manager coordinator, if just the people that answer the phone get too many calls, they want to make a difference. And and I got sent home over that as a lifer who wasn't even qualified. Certainly we can get Rory home. Well, and like you said, it seems like there's the least amount of obstacles in our way because yes. it doesn't have to be approved by anybody. Literally, folks, this is, you know, we talk about the power of one. We talk about, you know, what can I do? This is one of those situations where you have the power right here and now. You know, one phone call is equal to 100 people who think that the way you think. And one letter is worth a thousand people that think the way you think. And it really is. People don't get phone calls on behalf of somebody else. They just don't. I mean, maybe from one loved one or, or a couple of people now and again, but when there's more than 10 people calling on a situation, you bet it gets noticed because it is absolutely unheard of. It doesn't happen. So this is- And they can make the world turn. Like I say, I was not eligible. But when the staff came to, I was working in the factory, when they came there and, and uh, my supervisors and other supervisors were worried, why, why is this group of bigwigs? And they explained that they're coming to get me because I'm going home. That group <laughs> knew I was a lifer and not eligible to go home. Right. And I got an attaboy from every single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. No, absolutely. <laughs> and, and again, this is one of these situations where um, you know, if, if you want to make a difference, uh, this is, this is an opportunity that you have to, you know, so many groups and so many people believe that the only way to make change is to pass a law. And I, I believe that in this case, they did pass the law called the CARES Act, right? That they passed in, uh, actually March 27th of, uh, 2020, uh, President Trump signed it. Yeah. Right. Right. But the law didn't didn't the law made it possible for this to happen. It didn't yes. make it to where it had to happen. And that's the problem with most laws is they create a place for things to happen. But there's always a place outside those laws. And there's always a place where the law doesn't do it for you. You know, how many chances, especially with dealing with prison, when a when a law gets passed, it, it allows a pathway for something to happen. But it also has. Uh, a way for obstacles to get in the way. Like you had a, an opportunity um, with Obama's, uh, uh, you know, clemency um, deal that he was doing and you had a pathway and they, they threw rocks in the way of your pathway and they stymied it. Yes. So- And, so and that, that's sad. And that, that was from, like you say, one rambunctious prosecutor was able to, to thwart the process there. I, I never got the review by, you know, by the White House that, that, you know, really by law, I should have been accorded, you know. I, I remember hearing that and how, how it, it, it really, it really got to me because I was like, you know, they, the, the criminal justice system acts like gangsters in the worst possible way. So when, when gangsters want to hurt you, well, they might hurt you, but when they really want to hurt you, they go after your friends and family, right? That's the thing that you can't do anything about. And I can remember when I was locked up and the prosecutor was doing things that was keeping me from being able to get
get out. Um, and my wife was trying to do everything she could to, cause we had a pathway to get me out. And, and my wife was trying to, you know, exercise every possible option she had. And I can remember when she called me up one time afraid because they threatened her and they told her the things that they could do to her. And, and I was locked up. So I was powerless and, and to feel that angst, like, you know, it's the most horrible feeling and they do that and, and, and it's dehumanizing and it completely diminishes, you know, it, it breaks spirits. It, it's, it's how people, uh, you know, throw in the towel because they lose that, you know, they lose that hope and fight. Well, Craig, um, we had a bit of a glitch, but I, I think we had a powerful show. Um, and I believe that we've got a call to action and I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can to get something up on the website by tomorrow and, um, get this thing clipped up so that we can use it. And, um, you know what, if there's ever a time that you want to get involved today, tomorrow, the next day is going to be a great time. I can't imagine, um, if we do this thing, even halfway good that we might find out that Rory Meeks got himself. Um, released to home confinement because of the efforts of a bunch of activists and advocates all across the country. Craig, why don't you uh, give us your final word here? And that's true. We collectively can actually uh, walk a man wrongly held in prison for more than 10 years. We have the power to walk him out of prison. And, and I hope we, meaning each and every one of us, can just make that phone call, can just make that uh, email to the either to the prison or to the director of the Bureau of Prisons. And again, just one last thing. His name is Rory Meeks, M-E-E-K-S. And if you just want to get his information, his Federal Bureau of Prisons inmate number is 66138-029. And it'll be on the, uh, the Human Solution International website tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, Craig. As always, a great time doing this. It's so much better doing the show, you being a free man. So <laughs> I, I, it, just, it just warms my heart. We're right on time. We'll catch you guys all next week. And uh, thank you for helping, everybody.